in our quest to avoid the local to global heartbreak ever happening again. We saw in our previous video an idea of a property of sets that might let us avoid the possibility that an infinite collection of truths might not glue together into a single truth. The idea that we had was to look at sets that had this cover finiteness property, that it never requires an infinite collection of open sets to cover my set. A finite subcollection will always be sufficient. So that property is nice, but it's kind of hard to work with sometimes. Could there be a way for us to revisit this local to global heartbreak example, right? The function which was bounded at every one of these open intervals, but which was not bounded on a subset of their union, right? Would there be a way for us to revisit this and instead of framing it in terms of open sets and covers and subcovers, which are kind of messy, and instead use tools that we already are familiar working with from first semester analysis, namely, is there a way to do this with sequences? instead. In this video, we'll find out that the answer is yes by introducing the notion of what I call a subsequentially complete set. So we're looking for a way to kind of rule out the same problem that we had with this example with the set from 0 to 1, inclusive of 1, and excluding 0, right? That this open end is what caused the problem, seemingly, in our uh, local to global heartbreak for the boundedness of the function f of x equals 1 over x. But if I don't want to use open covers and subcovers and that kind of nasty business to rule out this open end, is there a different way that we can do it? Could we prevent the local to global heartbreak by preventing sequences of points from inside my set from converging outside of the set? This seems like a way to use some of the more high-powered results about sequences that we had from our first semester of real analysis. Um, as a way of kind of getting around this local to global heartbreak without having to fuss with sets and covers and subcovers. So what we might be led to is this possible idea to say, well, why don't we just try to force every convergent sequence of points whose terms belong to A, can we just try preventing those from having a limit that's outside of A? And this is a pretty good idea. The problem is that it's going to give us kind of two watered down of a criterion, because this is going to have something to say about all of the convergent sequences of points from inside of A. But there are a whole lot of sequences of points from within a set which don't converge, and maybe those non-convergent sequences could sort of screw with our intuition in other ways. So what we're going to look for is a slightly more general statement that can tell us something not just about the convergent sequences of points from my set, but the se any sequence of points from within my set. So here's how we're going to start this definition. This is going to be a definition of what I call a subsequentially complete set A, or SC for short. So we're going to start this definition by quantifying it on every sequence of points that belong to A. So any sequence at all, as long as all of the points in my sequence belong to the set A, then this definition should have something to say about that sequence. Whether or not that sequence is a convergent sequence, because that's a pretty strong condition. So what can I say about the sort of limiting behavior of a sequence if I don't know whether it's a convergent sequence or not? Well, the best that I can hope to be able to do is to say something about the limiting behavior of at least one of its subsequences. So if the whole sequence doesn't converge, maybe we can hope for some portion of it, some subsequence of it, to be convergent. And so that's what we're going to do in this definition. We're going to say that a subset is subsequentially complete if every sequence of points from my set, first of all, has a convergent subsequence, so that's the first surprise, like one of its subsequences has to converge, and the second part of the surprise is that the limit of that subsequence has to be a member of the set A, right? So that's where the, the limit being an A in this slightly different condition over here uh, sort of shows up again in our ultimate uh, requirement. So we're going to call a subset of the real numbers subsequentially complete. If it is not possible for you to give me a sequence of points, all of whose points belong to my set, which does not have a convergent subsequence whose limit is in my set. Right? So any sequence of points in A has a subsequence whose limit belongs to A. So this seems like a really good and really promising idea because, for example, what it avoids is the possibility like this. So let's focus on a different set that doesn't include an endpoint of itself, right? Um, the, the set from minus 1 to 1. And the sequence of points that has the formula minus 1 to the n times n over n plus 1. So what do the terms of this sequence look like? And so here's what the members of that sequence look like, right? It starts out at, you know, about 
what is that, two thirds, and then it's negative three fourths, and it's positive four fifths, and it's negative five sixths, and so it's oscillating in sign back and forth. But in absolute value, these sequences are approaching one. Right? And so because of the alternation, it's kind of bouncing back and forth and trying to kind of approach both negative one and one, depending on whether we take the subsequence of even index terms or the sequence of odd index terms. Um, and so this is an example of a sequence which does not converge. And so I can't use convergence as a way to kind of tell me something about the set to which the members of this sequence belong. And yet, it does have convergent subsequences, and the convergence of those subsequences happens to limit on these forbidden endpoints, the positive one and the negative one, which my set just happens not to be including. And so I'd like for the sequence criteria to be able to pick up on that. And so that's why we insist on not just quantifying something about the convergence sequences, but even those sequences which don't converge, but which might have a subsequence that does. And so for a subsequentially complete set, every sequence is going to have a convergent subsequence, and the limit of that convergent subsequence has to remain inside of the same set that the terms came from. So what, if anything, can we say about the subsequentially complete sets? We were able to say in the previous video that cover finite sets were necessarily bounded. What can we say about these subsequentially complete sets? Well, what we can say is that subsequentially complete sets are closed. Here's an idea for how we might do that. Uh, remembering that closed sets are really nothing more than the complements of open sets. Maybe we can do this by showing that if k is a subsequentially complete set, then the complement of k is open. If I show the complement of k is open, then I have shown that k is closed. So how should I show that the complement of k is an open set? Well, let me pick a point in the complement of k. I just have to show that that point is an interior point to the complement of k. In other words, that there exists an epsilon ball around my x, which is entirely a subset of the complement of k. But if that's not true, if x is not an interior point of the complement of k, that must mean that there are some points not in the complement of k, in other words, some points in k, which get arbitrarily close to my x. And if there are such points that get arbitrarily close to my x, that sounds an awful lot like a sequence of points of k whose limit is x, which is not an element of k. So that's kind of the sketch of the proof that we're going to just write out right here. So if k is a subsequentially complete set, let's pick an x that belongs to the complement of k and try to show that x is an interior point to k complement. So let's make the contrary supposition that x is not an interior point of the complement of k. If it's not, that means that there is no epsilon ball around x, no epsilon neighborhood around x, which is entirely a subset of the complement of k. But not being entirely a subset of the complement of k means that there exists a point from outside the complement of k that belongs to that epsilon ball. In other words, there exists a point of k in every epsilon ball around x. So what we can do, for example, is we can choose a sequence of epsilons which gets progressively smaller. Let's take my epsilons to be one, a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth. So these epsilons are, are limiting upon zero. Each one of those is going to define a, an increasingly smaller epsilon neighborhood around x. And each one of them, according to this supposition here, is going to contain a point of k. So let's let xn be that point of k which is contained in the one over two to the n radius ball around x and is a point of k. So I have a sequence of points in k that are limiting upon x. But again, because these radii are a sequence approaching 0, we can show that this sequence of points xn actually does approach x. And therefore, every subsequence of the xn's is also going to be convergent to x. But x did not belong to k. And that contradicts the idea that k is a subsequentially complete set. So this is really a proof by contraposition, right? If k is not a closed set, that means k complement is not an open set. And then from that, we deduce that k could not have been subsequentially complete. So the contrapositive is, if k is subsequentially complete, then it must be closed. So up until this point, we've seen two different ideas for how to get around the local to global heartbreak. The cover finiteness property, which uses open covers and finite subcovers, and from which we were able to deduce that any cover finite set must be bounded. Now we've also seen a second criterion called subsequential completeness, 
using sequences of points from my set and insisting that every sequence of points from my set must have a convergent subsequence whose limit also belongs to my set. From this criterion, we're able to deduce that every subsequentially complete set must be closed. So the next thing we need to figure out is how do these notions relate to one another? Is there a difference between the sets that are cover finite and the sets that are subsequentially complete? And whether there is or there isn't, what does any of this have to do with maybe simpler criteria that we could use to identify when the local to global heartbreak can be ruled out? So in the next video, we're going to figure out how these two different local to global heartbreak avoidance maneuvers are related to one another and what that tells us about the more easily identifiable properties of such sets.